gives us. I really came here to encourage you today and to tell you to pursue the vision that God gave you. As a church, but as individuals, because as you pursue what God has individually called you to do, it brings a corporate benefit to it. There was children of Israel that they wanted to stay back and they didn't want to go to the Jordan. They didn't want to cross the Jordan and go and fight. And Moses said, don't do that lest your brethren be disheartened. When, when we don't play our position, it disheartens people. I want to encourage you to stand behind your pastor. Stand behind the vision here. And do what you can do to serve. Because you don't want to be the cause of someone else quitting. You don't want to be the reason why people are disheartened. It's really important that you start to play your position. And you find out exactly what God's called you to do. And you step into it. See, a lot of times in religion, we say a lot of religious stuff like, I'm waiting on God. But in reality, according to James chapter 4, God's waiting on you. It says, draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. He took 2,000, he, 2000 years ago, He took a step toward humanity. Now it's time humanity take a step toward Him. He, we're waiting for a move of God. God is waiting for a move of man. Oh, Jesus! No man. Okay. He it was that way before he created you. Less of me, more of you, Lord. Well, he created you to fully occupy you. Not so you wouldn't exist. We have religious mindsets that got to go. See, in the Old Testament, there's something that I was reading. It was in the book of um, Haggai. And it said that the Lord stirred up the people to build the house of God. The priests and all the people. And um, I was like, oh, that's really great. And, um, and the Lord said to me, yes, in the Old Testament, I stirred them up. In the New Testament, I told Paul to tell Timothy to stir himself up. God will not do your job and you cannot do his. Your breakthrough is one act of obedience away. You're one act of obedience away from your breakthrough. When Jesus said that the kingdom of God is at hand, he was actually saying that the kingdom of heaven, it's actually plurals, the kingdom of the heavens, which means not up there, but all around here, is at hand. It says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. It's the same concept of the kingdom of the heavens is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What God is saying is at any given moment, in any given time, the kingdom can break in. And God's sovereign rule can be manifested on earth. When Jesus would minister, he would say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, meaning it's within reach. The time is now and you're the people. Jesus never put heaven way up there. He always brought it right down here. We're, we are we are like we are hell bent on flying away on a cloud. I mean, that's what we want. But God says, I want to like sit on David's throne in Jerusalem. I, I mean, I'm not trying to be a jerk or anything. I'm just saying we, we just have this a fear escape mentality. God wants to heal our minds. Now, one of the one of um, the way Jesus. Um, let's go to um, go to Mark twelve. Let me just give you the context to Mark twelve. Before Mark twelve is what Mark eleven. Now, Mark eleven is most fascinating, especially toward the end, because the scribes and the elders and all the religious people they come to Jesus and they start grilling him with questions. Now, Jesus loves this. The Bible doesn't say this, but I could just imagine because I know his personality. I could imagine him winking at his disciples and smiling and answering these questions because he just starts railing on them 
and he does it in love. He died for these people. When you hear people talk about the religious people and they always talk about Jesus bashing the religious people or being really confrontational to them, that's true, but it's still in the context of his love for them. It's still in the context that he died for them. It's still in the context that he, he wants them to be saved. So we have to remember that. Is the, is the, the issue of religion is the posture of your heart and how you think. The only thing that's separating you and God is your mind. Right now, there's no distance between you and Christ. He lives in you. The only distance is from here to here. So they come to Jesus and they go like this to him. They go, so tell us by what authority do you do these miracles? Now, these are like the most famous religious people on the planet. You know? And they come to him and he just smokes them. He goes, let me ask you a question. Was John the Baptist from God? And it says that they feared the people. And so they didn't want to say that John the Baptist wasn't from God because the people believed in John the Baptist. Anytime you fear people, you'll always be spiritually blind. Fear is a blinder. So he says that you know, John, they, they didn't say, they don't answer, they, they, they do, we plead the fifth. They pled the fifth, you know. And um, what was interesting is, if they would have answered that question, for what they knew to be true about that question, the revelation of who Jesus is would have touched them. This one question, determined if they were going to be able to discern who Jesus was. Often in our life, God will give us a token to see that if we can discern the full treasure that's on its way. Elisha's servant saw a little tiny cloud and he said, rain is coming. Often God will bring about a token that's actually a sign that points to the full manifestation of what God promised. But if you can't discern the forerunner of what God's doing, you will not discern what God does when He establishes what He's doing. For example, the forerunner, this the concept of forerunner. Way before David's tabernacle, there was Samuel's prophetic school. David was not the entrepreneur to music. Samuel was. The prophetic schools had musicians. Elisha called for the musician. That concept comes from way back in Samuel. The fruit of Samuel's life was that when Elisha was, was when Elijah was trying to get rid of Elisha, every city that he went into, there was prophetic people. And the word of the Lord was in every single city. That was the fruit of one man's life who knew how to create an atmosphere that God could speak to people. That concept discipled a nation. And the presence of God is what David surrounded his kingdom in. In David's tabernacle, there was no veil. I mentioned this the last time I was here. There was no veil. Meaning, the only thing that happens behind the veil that doesn't happen in front of the veil is God speaks. Before you get into the most holy place, it's about you keeping ordinances and you doing what you're supposed to do. By being faithful to do those things, God says, okay, that's great. Come into my presence and I'll speak to you. So what was happening behind the veil, it says, let the light of your face shine upon me. What that is meaning is when God opens up his mouth and speaks, the light from heaven comes down and God brings revelation. In the Holy of Holies, there is no natural light. There's only supernatural light. David said, great, love the idea. Uh, in my tabernacle, the whole place is going to be the Holy of Holies. There's no veil. You know what David said? David said, you know what? Under my watch, there's going to be no separation between God and His people. And David created an atmosphere that God can speak into. And that was the very thing that saved his life. And that's why he didn't want to kill Nathan like the rest of the kings. The rest of the kings wanted to kill the prophets because they never created an atmosphere where God could speak to people. David understood the, 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 the victories that he had behind closed doors. And he manifested that openly, publicly. And he created an atmosphere where God could speak. 
And that was the very thing that saved his life and his kingdom. If David would not have responded to the rebuke of Nathan, the Bible would have been written a whole different way. It's really important that we respond to God when God brings correction into our life. Those who are mature respond to correction properly. This is a huge deal in the body of Christ. I'm offended, I'm getting up and I'm leaving. Well, you're going to be in the same situation in another church at another time with a different personality. And it may be worse than the personality you were supposed to deal with the first time. People say, man, I don't like, you know, big churches. Why? The same kind of thing in a little church. You're dealing with people. It's the same thing. And then, wow, I'm done with the church. I'm going to start a house church. And guess what? You have the same stuff in the house. You can't run from it. So Jesus answers the Pharisees. He answers the Sadducees. And then the scribes come to him. This is, this is amazing. Now, Jesus, remember, he's in the temple. He gives this amazing discourse uh, about the vineyard. After he tells the people, I'm not telling you why, what authority I do stuff in. That's, this is crazy. You don't understand. It would be like Pastor Mike telling me something, and I walk in here and I say, I'm not telling you who my covering is. Just listen to what I'm going to say. Now, you, you would be like, this kid is totally rebellious. He probably doesn't have a pastor. He's pretty arrogant. So, but the thing is, the stuff that Jesus did was really, really radical. And unless you really understand their culture, you don't really understand exactly what he's doing. He walks into their temple. It's not his temple. He never went through any of that temple stuff. He walks into their temple and says, by the way, I'm not telling you why I'm doing what I'm doing. Then they start asking him dumb questions. The Sadducees ask him about the resurrection. They don't even believe in the resurrection. What kind of stupid question is that? That would be like someone saying, tell me how to speak in tongues. They don't even believe in speaking in tongues. Or some sort of challenging spirit that always wants to contend and argue with people. So he doesn't give in to that. And so he smokes them in their own house. And he says to the scribes, the scribes out of all of them were the closest. He said to them, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And um, it's really interesting how he responds to them. But first, he responds to the Pharisees and the elders. And he talks about a guy in a vineyard. And they knew prophetically that he was speaking about them. It's interesting how they couldn't see who he was, but they could see themselves. <laughs> so then he, then he goes on to them, and then he says this. And then they come to him. And then he says, and then he starts quoting uh, the Shema Israel, Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God is one Lord. Hear, O Israel. And what's really interesting is, now, he didn't say this in Greek, and guess what? He didn't say it in English. He's speaking it in the language that it was written, meaning he spoke two languages. When he was outside, he was speaking Aramaic. He was speaking a common language. When he sat in the temple talking to the temple people, he wasn't speaking Aramaic. He was speaking Hebrew. He go, and then he quotes the Shema Israel and he says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now what he actually said to them is setting them up for what he's about to say, but they don't have ears to hear. He is revealing who he is. He says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is a man. The word one in Hebrew means a man. He's saying, hey guys, hear, O Israel, listen, understand. The Lord your God, Jehovah, Yahweh, Adonai, He's a man. He's standing in front of you. If you've seen the Father, if you've seen the Son, rather, you've seen the Father. The Lord your God is one and He's standing in front of you. But you can't see Him. Then he goes into this thing and he says this. And he answered, and this is verse 35, Mark 12, 35. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how say that the scribes, he asked them, he says this. He goes, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? So what he's saying is, first of all, we understand that Jesus speaks King James. I'm just joking. He says to them, Tell me your interpretation. 
scribes? Tell me about the scripture, about your King David. Tell me what the most respected man in all of your history has to say. He's going somewhere. Watch this. How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? How He's saying, how is the Messiah the son of David? Watch what he says. For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. That's 36. Verse 37, David therefore called him Lord. And whence is he his son? How is he his son if he calls him Lord? And the common people heard him gladly. The common people heard in faith. The religious people could not understand what he's saying. He was talking to them about a very deep theological thing. He was saying, how can the son of David be the Messiah? Because the Lord your God is a man. <laughs> oh, yes. You, you get what I'm saying? He sets them up. He goes and he tells them that the, the guy of the vineyard, they're going to kill his son. <laughs> you guys want to kill me. I get it. He said, this is marvelous. This is the Lord's doing. He's telling them, you're not going to take my life. I'm going to lay it down. <laughs> That's what he's saying to them. And then he says to them, the Lord your God, he's a man. <laughs> and then he goes and says, how? How can the son of David... Be the Christ. How can he be the Messiah? See, if they would have received that, they would have known who he was. But the problem with them was they didn't have ears to hear. They weren't listening. They weren't, they, they were just not listening. Now, David entered into an encounter. I'm going to wrap up real soon. David entered into an encounter through listening. When the Lord Jesus quoted that verse, he revealed himself in the context of the person who heard him. The last way Jesus reveals himself in the book of Revelation is the root and the offspring of David. The revelation of this of Christ is in the context of a man who was listening to him and created an atmosphere for a whole nation to listen. The nation was centered around the presence of God, the voice of God. The voice of God is never detached from his presence. If God is speaking, his presence is there. It says that Jonah ran from the presence of the Lord. God commanded him to go to Nineveh. You know where his presence went? where his command was, Nineveh. It says that he ran from his presence. Why? Because with the command of God, the presence of God goes. The last concept I want to deliver, I'm just, I can't really preach about it. John chapter 17. All of the disciples are sleeping except John. John was watching and waiting. And the one who was listening is the one who penned down, again, a conversation between the Father and the Son. You have been invited into the depth of that mystery. When you enter into that kind of an intimacy with the Lord, the insecurities in your life break. Everything in your life changes when you intimately know who God is. That's what you were created for, and you're created to release that. I want to encourage you, because I don't have time, read John 17 later. There was three things that Jesus did to be faithful to what God called him to do. Search it out for yourself. Actually, I'm going to read them. There are only three scriptures. Why not, right? Three scriptures Jesus gave when he was talking to the Father. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. The way you glorify God is by finishing what he's called you to do. It's not by singing and shouting. Wow. Here's what he did. I have manifested your name unto those you gave me. 17.6. 17.8. I have given them the words which you gave me. 17.12. I have kept them in your name. Here it is. 
This is what you're called to do. This is what your faithfulness to God requires. For you to speak what he's saying. And for you to manifest the nature and the character of God. Meaning, with character and power. Third thing, I have kept those in your name. Meaning God entrusts things to you and people to you. And you need to be faithful to keep those people like a sheep, keep sh you know, like a shepherd keeps sheep. You need to be faithful, whether it's your children, whether it's the people that God's brought into your influence. Those are three areas in your life where you must be faithful. I'm going to pray that God will help you to do that because I believe it's in your heart to do. Father, I thank you for these wonderful, precious people created in your image, Lord. I pray, Father, that you soften our hearts and open our ears. That we would hear your voice, God.